this chapter is on stability and tuning. You know this, it is not something that is mathematically new, but we will be seeing uh, mostly in the time domain uh, what happens when there is amount of, uh, when there is uh, dead time, how does it affect stability and uh, it requires detuning of the controller and so on. So, uh, these are the main topics, stability of a process without control, stability of a closed loop feedback control system and how to use these approaches to learn or see how dead time affects stability. First one or two, actually many, uh, you do not look for anything new uh, in terms of theory from this uh, module. We know about this uh, characteristic equation, about stability and all. So, we look at things mostly stability and time, because there were questions when I was giving the interactive module. Uh, remember, uh, we had seen that proportional gain little bit larger than the critical gain resulted in, uh, yeah, uh, what you can say expanding oscillations. So, that why does it happen and let we will see from the time domain point of view. So, we are looking at our PID control and when you put a PID controller in the loop, definitely you will be influencing the stability. The stability will be affected when you put a PID controller, either it will become uh, unstable or it could be at the margin of stability or it could be quite uh, stable. And then there is a compromise between stability and performance. So, this is our PID controller. I am again I'm taking the example of a single uh, heated tank, it is very similar to our interactive learning module and we have put a temperature controller here. If the temperature controller is a PID controller, this is the equation and if you uh, like you have seen in uh, one of the interactive modules, if the gain is higher than some particular value, I do not remember what it was 9 or 11 or something like that in the interactive learning module, then we had oscillations which diverged, um, yes. otherwise it was good. So, this is yes, okay, it is stable, then this is not acceptable. So, first you define stability in the, from our, uh, there are many ways of defining stability. Uh, we, we use the definition of a bounded input, bounded output. We all know that I think BBO stability from other courses, you might have learned this, uh, that system is stable if all bounded inputs to the system result in bounded output. So, all not just one. You, so, you cannot test stability. Im, important implication for us is that you cannot and this is a common mistake, you cannot tell me or tell anyone else the system is stable because you have given a bounded, in, you have given some step input or something like that or sign input and then is a system is stable. Therefore, you cannot conclude that it is bounded input, bounded output. You cannot conclude that from your simulation. <laughs> You can, you understood what I am saying? So, if you give one bounded input, like a step is a bounded input and if you see that the output is bounded, do not jump to the conclusion that it is bounded input, bounded output stable. It cannot be verified from that point of view. So, what are the, uh, in uh, again from our point of view, what are the inputs that uh, example or example inputs which are bounded and one example input which is unbounded, we will see. So, this is a bounded input, you can see, uh, this is also, step is also bounded. An example of an unbounded input is a ramp kind of, unbounded, it goes without bounds. Give this to a process and look at the output. So, for all bounded inputs, if the output is bounded, then uh, it is very difficult to check practically, how can you give all bounded inputs. So, we have some simple tests for uh, Bebo stability, I will not be looking at any state space, it is just simple transfer functions. So, you can fill up the blanks if all alpha i, this is what, this is the denominator of the transfer function. If the, and alpha i is a solution to the denominator, that means the roots of the denominator. <coughs> How do you determine stability? We have seen this in one of the earlier uh, modules. Uh, this is just a, uh, we pull that slide to this, if all uh, the real parts of the roots are negative, then it is stable. If any one is in the right half plane, the real part, if any one is in the uh, right half plane, then white is unstable. And uh, complex white is 100 amps. So, this 
So the question, uh, the reason why I am revisiting some of this is because when we did that Ziegler Nichols tuning, we remember, you remember that you used only proportional controller. You turned off I and D and used only proportional controller for Ziegler Nichols tuning. So then at some value of gain, the system uh, was critically, uh, marginally stable and then at some uh, higher value than that, it was unstable. So some people ask, how do you uh, correlate that with uh, the notion of stability as we studied here, okay. So the answer is on this slide, now this is for a different example. What happened actually is that you form the characteristic equation, you have only proportional controller and you have a tank. So you have the process uh, transfer function and you have proportional controller, compute the characteristic equation, it is shown here, 1 plus GP that is you know the denominator of the closed loop transfer function and uh, you have KC here, pure proportional controller here, uh, find out at what value of KC, this is equal to 0. So that gives you the KC <coughs> required for that ziegler nichols tuning. You remember the Ziegler Nichols tuning, we by trial and error we found out a value of Kc uh, that was giving us uh, uniform oscillation or it was at the marginally stable condition. That is not possible, uh, you cannot take this approach and do it every time in practice because in practice you need to have transfer functions. You need to know the process transfer function, you need to know the wall transfer function and you need to know the sensor transfer function. So if you know all this pretty well, then you can um, write down the characteristic equation and determine KC. But when you are facing a big plant, a huge plant, complex plant, who will give you this transfer functions, P, GP, GV, GS. So because you do not have knowledge of this transfer function, therefore you are going for an experimental procedure to determine KC at a critical gain. You understood the reason why Ziegler Nichols uh, uh, presented experimental procedure? They could as well use this, but in practice when you go to complex plants, you cannot get the transfer function. So therefore, you cannot write down the characteristic equation and therefore, you cannot find out uh, analytically the critical gain of the system. This is from the, you know what is this diagram? How do you find out say, root locus of the gain? As the gain is increased, the root, uh, roots approach the imaginary axis and then they cross the imaginary axis and go into the right half plane, the shaded region which is unstable. This is stable and this is unstable. So as you play with gain, so for the mixer, this is the characteristic equation. You can determine Kc, Ziegler Nichols Kc you can determine from this. Now the problem comes uh, with this approach. When can you use this approach first of all? What is this approach based on? based on determining the roots of the characteristic equation, right. So the characteristic equation is like this, you can find out the roots. How are you finding out, which technique you are finding out? If you look at the characteristic equation, what kind of characteristic equation is this? It's a polynomial characteristic, right. This is a polynomial uh, kind of uh, this thing. So you can determine the roots of a polynomial and from that you can determine the values of Kc and other parameters which will make the equation equal to 0. That is the meaning of saying that you are finding out the roots or the zeros of the polynomial. So can you use this approach if you are having a process transfer function with dead time? You are using first order plus dead time transfer function for modeling all your systems, time constant, time delay and gain. So if your process transfer function, you can just put it down on paper and see whether you can use this approach if your process transfer function is having time delay. If GP is having time delay, then what happens to the characteristic equation? How is the characteristic equation going to look like? When GP is having time delay, it will have an exponential term. So what we call that as a, it is not a rational transfer function, it is an irrational. So when there is a time delay term appearing in the characteristic equation, how do you solve for the roots? Can you solve for the roots? Uh, like you are solving, uh, you cannot use the methods that you use for polynomial because no longer it is a polynomial. It is not a polynomial. Your characteristic equation is not a polynomial if there is time delay. So you, this method will fail. The characteristic equation met method is not a You will have to adopt a different procedure 
to find out the value of Kc if your process transfer function or any of the other transfer function like the wall or the sensor they have time delays you cannot use this because you cannot find out the roots so if the equation is having a dead time the term e to power of minus theta theta is the time delay appears in this characteristic equation and you cannot calculate the roots using your polynomial root finding method you need another method one of the other methods is the border stability method okay actually you can use other methods like the nyquist one also you can use because nyquist um, stability criterion is a very powerful stability criterion. Uh, it is useful, uh, it, it is applicable for both rational and irrational transfer functions. So, it's very powerful uh, uh, criterion. The other one is uh, similar, we have Nyquil, uh, Nyquist stability criterion, we have Boda stability criterion, we have Nicole stability criterion and so on. So, in all the three different plots you can verify or ascertain the stability of the closed loop system. The one that we will be looking at is border stability, but I will give you some feel for actually what we are going to put in the stability method before we actually put down the stability criteria. So, you do a thought experiment and from this we will uh, come out with some time domain feel for the border stability criteria. Look at this, uh, this is a process, a closed loop, not really closed loop. Here for time being we have opened this loop. So, you have broken this loop just to uh, look at what happens in the open loop. Supposing your set point is a sign signal. Let us say your set point is a sign bounded input. Okay? I am sending a set point. So, that one will enter here, trace the flow of the signal around the loop. The sign is going through the feedback path, going through the wall and if it is a linear system, we are assuming that the system is linear, then it the same signal will, this signal will be little bit, maybe little bit or maybe considerably changed because it has gone through the wall. Wall is having its own dynamics, own gain, time constant. So, Nevertheless, it will still, still be a sign signal if it is a linear system, it will go through this and then it will come out as a sine wave signal. So, sign will try, if the whole thing is linear and set point a signal that is an input signal in the form of set point, a sinusoidal one will travel through this loop and come out at the out, output, output will also be a sign signal. Now, we want to come out with a criterion for stability based on this thought experiment. You have given a sign signal of a particular amplitude, okay. When do you uh, call the whole thing as stable, when do you call the whole thing as stable, when do you call it as unstable and when do you call it as very well stable, loosely speaking. You give a sign signal at the output, if you are getting a sign signal of ever increasing amplitude then you will say that the system is unstable. When, do you, when will you call this as critically stable or marginally stable? If the sign signal which is given that amplitude, yeah, it retains that kind of amplitude. And if it is attenuated, the sign signal is attenuated, better for you. So, the input, is, uh, input uh, amplitude has been reduced. So, this is in the open loop, okay. But if you close the loop, this signal will return. You just give a sign signal once, okay, close the loop, then what happens? This signal will keep going round, isn't it? If you close the loop, supposing this is, I have given the sign uh, input for some time and I have stopped, close the loop, what happens? The signal that is coming at the output will again enter this is the feedback path, it will go through this and it will keep going around, right? The signal will go around. Now tell me what will happen if the system is, the whole thing is unstable, what do you expect will happen if this system is critically stable and if it is much better than stable? What will happen if the system is critically stable? You give a sign signal of a certain amplitude, 
What will happen if the system is critically stable? What happens? It will return with the, every time it goes through the loop and returns, it will have the same amplitude. Okay, sustained oscillation it will have, right? If it is unstable, it will increase in amplitude. Otherwise, the third case, the amplitude will keep attun getting attenuated. Yeah, this is the field. I am trying to come to the uh, stability criterion now, that minus 180 degrees and gain is equal to 1. What does it mean in the time domain? That is what we are trying. Now, you come back to the situation where it is, the loop is critically stable. If the loop is critically stable or marginally stable, what did you say will happen? Every time the signal will return with the same amplitude. That means it is kind of synchronized. If it is having more amplitude, then the system will go unstable. That is in the path, if the signal gets amplified, then uh, every time it goes through the loop, it will get amplified and finally it will reach unbounded kind of limits. Now, can you tell me in terms of time domain, what is happening to the signal? You take the situation of marginally stable. I put this in a standard block diagram form for a helpful understanding to help you in understanding. So, this is the sign signal, this is an intermediate signal manipulated, this is the control signal, this is the situation with the loop open. Now, close the loop, this is the situation with the loop closed. So, the loop is closed here, in the block diagram also the loop is closed here. You give it only once, no forcing required, the signal will travel through like this, but it is sustained. When it is sustained, what happens? In terms of phase, yeah. In, in terms of sustained oscillation, like it is like you know, like you imagine that you are bouncing a ball, you are bouncing a ball. So, for the ball, uh, let us ignore the friction, etc., but you are bouncing the ball, you are hitting the ball from a certain height, from this height, I am bouncing the ball. If the ball has to bounce uniformly, then what is it that you have to do? You have to make sure that when it reaches this height again, you hit it with the same force. If you hit it earlier, means if you put your hand at a lower height and hit, then the amplitude of the bounce will reduce. If you wait till it bounces up and hit it, then the amplitude will become less. So, you, to have uniform bouncing of the ball, you must hit the ball at the correct time at the correct height. Means it should go down and comes here in terms of synchronization, your hand must be synchronized with the point at which the ball is hit, right. If you hit it too late, then its amplitude is has increased. If you hit it too early, the amplitude of the bounce has decreased. Same thing for a signal. If you want to have sustained bouncing or oscillation of the signal, the signal must be in sync, right. When will it be in sync? You, imagine, uh, let us say this is 0 degrees, when it goes down to the floor, the ball is at minus 180 degrees, when it comes up to this point, it is 360 degrees. That is the way you are hitting. If you hit it later, then it is going to increase, if you hit it earlier, it will be less. So, the means the synchronization is talked now about in terms of phase. Going down and coming up is one cycle. So, when it goes to the lowermost point, it is 180 degrees away. When it comes back to the original position, it has covered 360 degrees, right? 0, 180, 360, like that it will go up. So, if you want a signal to bounce uniformly, and what must happen? When it returns to the original point, the complete 360 degrees must have been covered, right? Remember this. If it is less than that, it will not bounce with the same amplitude. If it is more than that, then it is going to expand. So, when the signal goes through the entire path and comes back to the original point, it must have gone through a phase change of 360 degrees for uniform muscle. Is that clear? Now, when you put a negative sign here, that is contributing to 180 degrees. A negative sign actually is contributing to 180 degrees, right? 
minus 1, how much phase lag it is hanging? It's like hanging in the polar form. What is the polar representation of minus 1? Magnitude is 1. How much is the phase angle? Pi minus 180 degrees. Sorry. Okay, you can say pi. So 180 degrees is contributed because there is a negative action. So remaining part of the loop must supply how much phase lag in order to have sustained oscillation? 180 degrees. So that 180 degrees phase lag means if the signal enters this open, forget the summer sign, when the signal enters the open loop system and when the signal leaves, there must be a lag of 180 degrees or a phase difference of 180 degrees. What is the meaning of that? The signal is reaching the peak here, it must reach the bottom point there, like that, okay. So that 180 degrees phase lag must be contributed by which part of the system? By the open loop part of the system because the negative sign contributes the other 180 degrees. So the open loop phase angle, if it is 180 degrees and for sustained oscillations, remember also you must hit with the same force. You must hit at the same point, but you must also hit with the same force. The amplitude, magnitude or the power at which you hit it must be the same as before. I am just talking about a simple day to day example, the bouncing the ball. If you hit the ball with very little force, but at this point it will die. The ball will just, uh, after a few dribbles, it will just stop. If you hit it too hard, means compared to the previous time, it will go up. So you must hit with the same magnitude and at the same time synchronization. So time synchronization or height synchronization and magnitude. So for sustained oscillation, one thing is that 180 degrees phase must be contributed by the open loop system. Whatever is there must contribute 180 degrees. The rest will be contributed by the summer anyways. The second thing that we are looking at is that the summer is not going to give you any uh, magnitude. It is one, only one unity magnitude it is saying. Minus one is having a magnitude of unity. So the summer is not going to change the magnitude. It is an open loop system whose magnitude can be unity or different from unity. If the open loop system magnitude is unity and if the phase contribution from the open loop part of the system is 180 degrees, then you will have perfect synchronized oscillation, the same amplitude. You got this? I hope the bouncing ball uh, explanation is clear. Hit the ball with the same power at the same point, you will have always the ball bouncing. Forget friction and other things, okay, in an ideal situation. If the power is different, the ball's bounce will be different. If you hit it too early in terms of time, that is in terms of phase lag, before it has covered 360 degrees, if you hit it, then it will change its bounce. So this is the time domain explanation for that minus 180 degrees and one point B. So think about the sine wave as it travels around the loop once. This is all what I said. If the sine is larger in amplitude after one cycle, then it will increase each time it goes around the loop, the system will be unstable. Yes. Now this is the critical frequency. When the sign, when the open loop system, at which point it contributes 180 degrees, at that point, if the magnitude is equal to one, then you will have uniform bouncing. If it is greater than 1, you will have ever increasing amplitude. If it is less than 1, it is fine. So put this all down and you remember the minus sign as I saying contributes another 180 degrees. This is the Bode stability criterion. At the critical frequency, G OL, OL means open loop minus 180 degrees. If the amplitude, amplitude at the critical frequency is less than 1, system is stable, if it is greater than 1, actually it should be instability, you can make this change. I hope you followed this because in the time domain what happens is given I think in only one book. So the time domain bouncing ball explanation in the book I have seen is the process control by Shinsky. In that book, the whole book is written in the time domain and really speaking it seems nobody has understood that book. Even the people who wrote other books did not understand this book. So I also read that book many times, but it's very difficult to follow. Everything is given in time domain. There is not a single transfer function anywhere in controls book. Can you imagine a controls book without any transfer function? Note state space, only time domain and how to tune controllers for all kinds of processes. 
is given in that book and is one of the world's topmost consultants in control system. So, the feel for the whole thing is in hammer. Say, when a signal goes up and down and returns to the original point, it has covered 360 degrees, right? So, when the ball, uh, th supposing I am considering this is my original point, the ball has travelled and come back to the original point. So, it has come back to original point means 360 degrees in its movement. It has gone up and it has come back to the original point 360 degrees. So, that in that sense, I am dividing this into 360. 0 is this point, 360 is this, next time it comes, it is 720 and all that. One, uh, yeah, minus 180 or plus 180 uh, is the point at which, you know, it is farthest away from this that the bottom that is the floor that is 180 degrees. Uh, whether it see there is no such thing as absolute phase lag, always phase is something that you know when this signal is hanging this phase, this signal is hanging this phase, the absolute phase is not uh, uh, known. It is we always talk about in terms of relative phase. Okay. So, I am ta I'm saying that this point is the starting point and when you are coming back to the starting point, you have travelled the entire 360 degrees. That is what I am just saying. And what is 180 degrees means? It is a point where it, you, for example, you are the farthest away and as you are coming back from that point, you are reducing the uh, phase back to the original one. Complete, complete, uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the question you are asking. There is one more transfer function in the feedback path. I am looking at what happens at this. The summer, because it is minus 1, what does the summer do? It only changes the sign of the signal. So, it introduces a phase of one, minus 180 degrees by, by the uh, phenomenon that it is doing. It is changing the signal sign from plus to minus and therefore, it is introducing uh, or it is contributing a phase lag of 180 degrees and it is not changing the signal in terms of amplitude. So, that is done at this point. Uh, this when a signal uh, is introduced for example here, it is going through the complete path and returning to the point at which it, a loop is broken. So, that phase should be 180 degrees and this will introduce another 180 degrees. So, the by the time the signal comes here, if the signal can come here only if the loop is closed. When the signal see you are starting at this point. By the time the signal travels this entire loop and comes back here, it should be in sync. 360 degrees uh, phase lag must have been experienced. Huh? First order plus dead time need not contribute only 90. Dead time can contribute a lot. The phase angle of a dead time transfer function will keep on increasing with frequency. I will come to the dribbling ball example. Okay? I hope that is not confusing you. I can dribble the ball fast, I can dribble the ball slowly, I can dribble the ball leisurely. At which speed I dribble is the frequency. The speed of dribbling is a frequency. If I give a ball to dribble and if I give some other person to dribble the ball, you both can be dribbling the ball from the same height with uniform oscillation, but that person may be dribbling the ball 10 times faster than you. You may be dribbling slowly compared to that person. So, the frequency at which you are dribbling, in one minute you may be dribbling the ball 10 times, the other person may be dribbling the ball 100 times. That is the frequency of the dribble. Now, when you are dribbling the ball 100 times, you may not be able to control the ball well. So, you might uh, hit it at the wrong point with a different force, whatever. Sometimes you might suddenly, it will go out of control, no? have you dribbled? So, you might hit the ball sometime at a lower height, sometimes you will hit it with a different force and so on. So, what we are talking about and which I did not explain uh, properly perhaps is this sine wave signal will have a frequency also. Now, if a sine wave of a particular frequency goes through this entire loop without any distortion and arrives at the starting point at the correct time then it will be sustained. Two, three things are there. Sine wave signal will have its own frequency. Let us say a sign of particular frequency has been put into the system. Now, if you want to have, if you are getting sustained oscillation, now let me put, if you are getting sustained oscillation, that means what has happened, this signal 
is having the same frequency, same amplitude and is in sync with the signal that has entered the system. In sync means what? When this reaches its peak, uh, this has also reached its peak. When this reaches its peak, this has also reached its peak. When this reaches bottom, this has also reached its bottom, like this. So you can see there are peaks and valleys. So the occasions are the moments at which this peak is being reached are exactly the same as the moments at which this peak has been reached. You got this for sign signal. If that is happening, that means the system is able to provide 360 degrees of phase, okay, and the whole system is an unity amplitude ratio. If that is not happening, if the signal is having a lesser amplitude than the signal that is entering, that means this system is having a magnitude that is less than unity. On the other hand, if this is increasing in amplitude, frequency will be the same. If this increasing in amplitude, that means that this whole thing has got a magnitude that is greater than 1. Now, what is meant by phase? This signal may need not be in sync with this signal. This signal can, supposing when this signal is at its peak voltage, okay, this may be having its least voltage. This is also sign signal. So that means they are how much, how many degrees out of phase. That is the meaning of phase lag and amplitude ratio. Okay. So now coming back to your question, this if I give a signal that is varying very fast, if I am hitting the wall very fast, it may not be that I am getting a uniform bouncing every time because of my problems. I am not able to maintain the force, I am not able to sync it, I am not able to hit it exactly. Whatever happens, this signal will be having different. So different frequencies of input will not give the same uh, output, like the same amplitude, same phase lag. -like. As the frequencies changes, this behavior will also change. So it will probably happen that at one frequency of the input signal, you are getting uniform oscillation. But at other frequencies, either it is dying down or it is increasing. You understood that? So if you are hitting the ball very fast, maybe you are going to uh, kill the ball, bounce, because you are not able to maintain it. Ultimately, your hand will go down and then ball will stand. Then you pick the ball again, you start dribbling. So that also is dependent on the frequency at which you are hitting now. Same thing for the signal also. If you send signals of different frequencies into the system, the output will not always be in sync. That is important point. If it is in sync at one frequency, it may not be in sync at other frequency. So the um, lag and as well as amplitude can be different at different frequencies. That is how you generate or you get the border plot. Is that a question you asked? Uh, time delay, when you are, uh, see when you are having first order system with time delay, the phase lag is not limited to 90 degrees. The phase lag is limited to 90 degrees only for first order system. But when you add a time delay, time delay's phase lag will change with frequency and it is unbounded. E to power of minus j omega into time delay. So what is the phase angle? Omega into tau d. As omega increases, the phase contribution will increase. As omega goes higher and higher, the phase angle of the time delay component will go, yeah, it will increase. It is unbounded. There is a Nyquist plot of systems with time delay difficult to analyze because they will keep going around in circles and very difficult to. I hope uh, it has helped you to understand, not uh, confused you, this bouncing ball. Like in time domain, it is very difficult to imagine and design uh, controllers. Very, very, very few people can do. I am a frequency domain designer. Uh, some feel for a time domain. Most of the people nowadays do not design in a frequency domain. Only the classical uh, people, they will design in frequency. Rest uh, might be using some optimization in time domain design. So think and of the phenomena. This is the phenomena that uh, gives you, you know, uh, this is the thought experiment that explains that minus 180 degrees and 1. What is the significance? I hope I have explained to you, uh, may not have been done very well. Uh, but you can look up the book by Shinsky, Process Control. He will explain this very well. And his whole book 
it's a uh, one of the most uh, you can say influential books in process control oil gas all those industries they uh, those control designers they read his book and try to implement controllers no instead of that we talk about what should happen when the face is uh, you said two pi whole loop you are talking about what should happen when the face uh, change is two pi that is 360 degrees what should happen for stability for marginally stable it's easy to start off when the face change is 360 degrees the ball has come back to original position okay then at that point what should happen the amplitude should not have been greater than 1 it should not uh, you know that magnitude of the closed loop should not be greater than 1 otherwise uh, the signal magnitude when the, it has gone through 360 degrees if it is having a larger amplitude than with what it started before then the oscillations are going to increase so when the phase lag is 360 degrees of the entire loop that means for the open loop the phase lag is 180 degrees then the magnitude of the entire closed loop should not be greater than 1 if it is equal to 1 it will be sustained if it is less than 1 it will be stable no, no that is easy. so think of uh, the situation when the complete phase change is 360 degrees and the magnitude of the entire system whether it's less than 1 equal to 1 or greater than 1. that is uh, the key thing so from the border plot we will just see then again if you have questions you can ask so if the sign is larger in amplitude after one cycle that means after 360 degrees how will it be larger in amplitude only if the magnitude of the closed loop is larger than 1 then it will increase each time around i think this you have followed so when the sign has a lag of 180 degrees due to element dynamics the other 180 degrees is from the negative sign ignore that um so for it to reinforce itself when the sign has a lag of 180 degrees due to element dynamics the feedback will reinforce the oscillation remember the minus sign for the other 180 degrees this is the critical frequency so at that frequency let us look at one example and then again see okay now we take an example in which the controller is a pi controller then the complete process gc gv gs is given by first order uh, transfer function because there are three tanks so three so therefore there is a cube here okay each tank is having time constant of 5 minutes time delay is 5 minutes and process gain overall is 0.039 so this is the process this is the pi controller and um, we are going to do an example for the three tank mixer system uh, where 5 minutes dead time has been added there is no dead time in the three tank mixer system it's all first order time constant but we have added for uh, just for example we have added a time delay of 5 minutes look at this condition and this is what has happened what is the critical frequency first of all the frequency at which the phase uh, is 180 degrees phase lag is 180 degrees right that is the critical frequency at that critical frequency if you evaluate the complete magnitude say if you evaluate the magnitude of all these elements at that particular frequency you are getting it as 0.75 so what happens 75% is the amplitude next time it travels then 75% of that when it travels next time like that it will be so there is a 25% reduction every time so is the output going to expand or uh, means say are, are the oscillations going to expand in uh, in terms of magnitude or they will be reduced attenuated every so it's a stable at that critical frequency what is the critical frequency the frequency at which 360 degrees of phase change occurs at that point the magnitude of the entire system is 0.75 that means if a sine wave of unit amplitude enters it will next time it will have only 75% of its amplitude and so on hmm, that is stable if the magnitude is greater than 1 that's how bode has arrived at it is stability grade if it is greater than 1 at the critical frequency what happen then every time it travels it will expand in terms of amplitude and it will go unbounded right so in no time this signal will go unbounded therefore how did you check the gain margin and stay in the uh, phase so the gain margin you now understood the concept of gain margin how far away on this side 
it is from 1. If it is 1, it will bounce with equal amplitude every time it goes through. If it is 0.75, it will die out. So, how much is the margin from, yeah. Now, if it is on the other side, is let's say it is 1.2, obviously it is unstable. So, then you, you know the sign of the gain margin also, I mean the gain margin, that sign also you have to take into account. So, I hope you are getting a better feel with this example. Uh, the, we all know the border stability criterion, but to correlate that with what is actually happening in the time domain is something that is new, I hope you. So, the sign will decrease in amplitude each time it travels around the loop, that is the whole point. You get this feel because say, looking at the frequency response, looking at the stability margin is all mathematically possible, but to get a feel, you have to think in the time domain. The time domain is what actually is happening. Do we see any frequency domain or Laplace domain around? No, we do not see. We all live in the time domain. So, you have to get a feel for this in the time domain because tomorrow some problem occurs, then you have to know of a way to fix it. So, time domain insight is always helpful. Are you okay now with this? It is a very simple slide actually, I have not told you anything radically new, it is only a new way of looking at things, time domain way. So, conclusion is stable, why? Because the sign will decrease in amplitude each time, each time it travels around the loop. It is, the loop is having a gain of 0.75, so anything you introduce, first time 0.75 of that, second time 0.75 of that and so on as it travels. This is now a uh, additional thing. Stability is first. The first consideration when you design a control system is to make sure that the loop is stable, closed loop stable. Does open loop stability matter to you? What is the meaning of open loop stability? Now, based on that bouncing ball, what is, uh, uh, tell me what is meant by open loop stability. If you open the loop, is there any worry about stability? Loop is like this is open loop, right? This is open loop. This is closed loop. So, you see that loop has been broken here in the feedback path, somewhere you break it. Now, this is open loop. The signal once it enters, it leaves. The criterion for closed loop stability is based on open loop, correct? That is what you have told me, that 180 degrees of phase lag should come from all the elements in the open loop. Magnitude should be equal to 1. The summer this, when you close this, what happens? Another 180 degrees is introduced. That is all that happens. So, your open loop criteria because the border plot is not for the closed loop, it is for the open loop. You look at this open loop, open loop. If this had been for the closed loop, then you would have to talk about what face lag. Now, you are clear. So, when people talk about 180 degrees and you are hanging what you call as negative feedback. The other 180 degrees is coming from the minus sign. Therefore, uh, when you are looking at the border stability criteria and you are looking at the frequency at which the phase lag is minus 180 degrees and you are looking at the open loop magnitude and open loop phase. This one. This means if you introduce a signal uh, like this, the, the output will be very large, infinite, that is all. Okay, this one. Yeah, this system is stable. This is just uh, for this three tank system, this system, three tank system with 5 minutes dead time added. If you use this PA controller tunings, you are getting stable, this response is stable, okay, but it is uh, not acceptable, it is very poor. Performance is poor, why? Because the tuning is still uh, not very good. This is the manipulated variable. Now, if you look at this plot, can you tell me how to retune the PA controller? Is the proportional gain, I told you one tip, is the proportional gain, this magnitude should be roughly equal to this one. Is it roughly equal to this final value? This change and the initial change due to proportional action should be almost of the same. If it, if for example, if proportional action is up to here and then it starts going up, that means you can increase the proportional gain. Now, you can roughly take the P as the same. But what you need to tune or retune is the integral part. What will you do? If you are finding response is, if this response is too oscillatory. So, you have to change the integral time, maybe little bit change you can make in proportional, but major change will come in integral time. So, how will you change integral time now, if the oscillations are too much? 
integral action reduces stability so adversely affects stability so you will have to reduce integral action or increase integral action if you increase integral action the loop will become more oscillatory you should reduce integral action if you have to reduce integral action then because it is inversely connected with ti so you should reduce ti means ti should be uh, reduce integral action means ti should be increased ti is 11 minutes the more you increase uh, ti less will be the integral action if you keep ti infinity there won't be an integral action but you will have offset you can evaluate the stability of process by evaluating the roots of characteristic equation but when you are hanging dead time you cannot evaluate the roots of the characteristic equation that whole problem comes because almost always we have processes with dead time so you cannot go for this roots of characteristic equation approach you have to go for some other criterion like the border stability criterion or the Nichols criterion so that uh, Ruth Hurwitz criterion can you use now for this kind of system with time delay processes with time delay border method is used stability does not guarantee good performance we know that and un unstable system is to totally to be avoided so what is the message that we are getting you have to tune controllers you tune controllers basic idea of tuning controllers is to keep a reasonable margin from instability that is why in that Ziegler Nichols tuning formula which we have seen we found out the KC required for marginally stable system and then we divided that KC by half means 50 percent we have reduced to keep a good margin from instability this reasonable margin might give good performance it may not give very good performance then you have to retune the controller here is the tuning chart which is taken from the Ziegler Nichols uh, method KU by two, 2 you found out what is KU KU is the critical gain which gave you sustained oscillations in that heated tank example so you know the critical gain of the proportional controller you divide that by 2 and implement that but if you are adding integral action KU by 2 plus integral action will again take the system towards instability because integral action moment you introduce it will uh, increase the instability so what you have to do detune the proportional 2.2 you understood why it is being done instead of using 50 percent of ku how much is 1 by 2.2 roughly because this is going to create uh, it's going to add some phase like 35 45 percent so instead of using 50 percent of the gain required for margin is stable now you are using 45 percent of the gain you are stepping little bit more away from instability because integral action will in, will also introduce some kind of instability you got this so that is the reason. and now you see very interesting what happened when you introduce derivative what is the value of gain that uh, Ziegler Nichols is recommending when moment you introduce derivative 1 by 1 1.7 is how much uh, almost 60 percent say now Ziegler Nichols say that you can have 60 percent of the critical gain when you are adding derivative let me repeat what I said if you are using only proportional controller Ziegler Nichols Zn they say that you use 50 percent of the gain critical gain when you are adding integral action they are saying use 45 percent of the critical gain because some instability will be contributed by integral action but moment you introduce derivative action then they are saying you use 60 percent of the critical gain for proportional action why is it like that because derivative mode adds stability to the system it adds some phase lead so that is the reason why derivative action uh, is very helpful what derivative action does it provides some phase lead buffer so that your proportional action can increase ideally you would like to use if there had been no stability problems you would have loved to use as much proportional action as allowable because proportional action is very fast instantaneous it's cases there's no differential equation no differentiation very fast is the fastest mode of action but because of instability or stability concerns you are reducing proportional gain if you introduce derivative proportional action has been increased that's why it is very helpful okay pd is uh, yeah it is used very rarely that's all yes De pd uh, 
is rarely used because I is almost always required to eliminate offset. If you use PD, you will get offset. Proportional mode is very fast, okay. Integral mode, uh, but gives a proportional mode gives you offset. Offset generally is not tolerated. So, to kill the offset, they introduce integral action. Okay. To add little more stability to improve the uh, speed of response, they have to increase integral action. So, they add derivative mode. If you add derivative mode, what happens? Your proportional action can increase. When proportional action is increased, the speed increases. Proportional action, keep in mind, is the fastest because it is instantaneous. Whatever is the input signal that is amplified by Kc and sent out. So, it is the fastest. So, proportional action is extremely good, unfortunately it gives you offset. To uh, kill the offset, because you cannot keep increasing Kc. If you increase Kc, you can reduce the offset, but uh, beyond a point Kc will give instability. So, you have to stop somewhere. Then what, still there is offset, you cannot accept it. What will you do? You will incre introduce integral action. Okay? If you want to improve things further, then you add derivative action. By that, some uh, stability buffer is provided by this. So, then you can increase integral action, uh, proportional action. Your question is why only P, uh, uh, why I cannot be removed? I cannot be removed because if you remove I, mostly you will get offset. You cannot tolerate. So, just to kill the offset, you always keep I in picture. If there is no offset happening, you use only P. Why PD also? You use only P. If there is no offset happening, that can happen in some examples where there is already integral action in the process. So, then you need only proportional controller. You understood? So, integral action's role is uh, actually is positive role is only one, it kills the offset. And if there is no offset appearing even without I, then do not add I. Unnecessarily, you will slow down the loop and destabilize the loop. So, that is it. PD can be used, it is used, but number of examples where PD is used is very few. Mostly you will not find PD, you will either find P, PI or PI. So, this is the ziegler nichols tuning. Just to tell you that now it is almost 70 years, 1942, how many years pre-independence time <laughs> tuning rule. So, since then more than 70, 75 years, uh, we uh, ziegler nichols is still uh, the reference. But people are not using ziegler nichols as it is, they are using refined or modified ziegler nichols It took about 50 years for people to come up with tuning rules that were better than ziegler nichols Now we have many tuning rules, we have more than 2,000 tuning rules. But ziegler nichols was the first uh, person. We, that was not based on analytical transfer functions and all. So like, like looking at the characteristic equation, you can design PPI controllers. For DC motor, you do not require to use ziegler nichols tuning. You can design the uh, D, uh, PID controller or let us say PEI controller at least or PD controller using only the characteristic equation of the DC motor that is there on the website or our website. Or. But the small cases is one scene, the other cases is huge plants in industries where you do not have transfer function, you cannot get the transfer function. So, an experimental approach, Ziegler Nichols method is an experimental method for tuning PID control, it is not an analytical approach. People are trying to provide the analytical background and improve upon that. So, there are many methods like refined Ziegler Nichols method and so on we use. They give better performance than Ziegler Nichols and we recommend that. But ZN method is a reference method. You understood? Its importance is because they were kind of first people to come up with systematic empirical tuning rules based on experiments. What do you do in time domain? and what do you do in open loop step test and closed loop. Open loop and closed loop, two different methods. Now, these are the tuning methods as uh, covered in Professor Marlin's book. Um, see all the, excepting Fertig I think, Cian Cohn uh, is uh, I think mo uh, heavily in Professor Marlin's book. Gain phase margin method, IMC method, Lopez method, Ziegler Nichols closed loop, Ziegler Nichols open loop. Open loop method means based on step test, which you have done, two point identification. Closed loop is the one that we did through interactive learning module. You change the gain of the proportional controller till you get oscillation and then reduce the gain by 50 percent. And if you are adding integral action, reduce it to 45 percent. 
and if you are adding derivative then increase it to 59 percent that kind of so this is complete uh, uh, summary you should select this based on your objectives or uh, every tuning rule is saying different objective that is also mentioned here stability objective gain margin is, uh, two, is two in Ziegler Nichols method the gain margin is two because 50 percent of the gain is being so 50 percent 4 is to 1 decay ratio that means the second time the signal will have only 25 percent of the amplitude as of the first time and third time it will have 25 percent. So, 4 is to 1 decay ratio and other tuning rules are all covered here is when there is time delay then things are really spoiled. When the time delay as a time delay keeps increasing you have to keep detuning the controller because time delay adds phase lag to the system. It uh, adversely affects the stability. If you use the same gains for the system with and without time delay, it will probably be very bad for you. So, whenever you notice that the time delay has increased or it is different or is whatever has changed, then you have to detune your EID controller.